Welcome back. Welcome back to another episode of In My Humble Opinion, brought to you by Unfiltered Media. I'm your host, Wilson Cheney, and I appreciate you appreciate you guys for coming back for another season. We're now in season two, and I just want to give a shout out to all the listeners, the viewers, supporters, even the haters, because y'all motivate <laughs> me as well. And I said I was going to bring some heavy hitters this season, and this person I brought on needs no introduction. He's a guy that I've been knowing for around three years now. I think it has been three years, mm-hmm. but this is a guy I've seen drop 60 points, 40 point triple doubles, just an all around amazing player that I've grown to respect wholeheartedly. And that man is Shannon Shorter. How are you doing today? Man, I really appreciate the introduction. You know, uh, I'm doing <laughs> well, though. I can't complain. I'm in split Croatia, you know, uh, enjoying this time with my wife and just growing with her a lot and just enjoying another season overseas. Um, I don't take these moments for granted. You know, this is my 10th pro season. I remember where I started. So just to be in the position I am in now, you know, I got to give glory to God. Facts. And over a decade, you played in the NBL, Turkey, Israel, and multiple other countries. And I just, this question just popped in my head, but I remember a long time ago, I saw this tweet by Mike James, and mm-hmm. he was showing people in the crowd, like throwing flames, infernos, and like fireworks and whatnot. How would you say the crowd experience is out there? Because I could tell you seen like a bunch of interesting things out there. Probably the um most live fans I ever seen was probably in Lebanon. Um mm-hmm. they had like I remember we was in the finals, right? We was in game six or game seven. I'm at the free throw line and um they was passing around a laser. So, like, as I'm getting ready to shoot a free throw, they pointing the laser in my eyes. They throwing stuff on the court. And, you know, they can't really get the laser because once they point it, they just throw it to somebody else in the crowd. And that was probably one of the most craziest experiences I, I've seen overseas. When I was in Turkey, you know, I did not seen fans throw fireworks on the court and throw food at players. And so I I, I didn't seen some crazy stuff. That's insane because I know people like, you know, over here in America, when we partake in sports, like, you know, we some people tend to say things to players, but it never gets to that level where it's like, you know, physically, like you know, throwing stuff at them. But I could tell like overseas that that fans, they are like super passionate about the sports. Like they'll literally die for the sport that for the sport that everybody plays and they really enjoy it to like an extreme level. No, absolutely. It's it's like vastly different from you know the nba from college basketball and etc you know in college you know fans storm the court after a team uh beats a higher ranked team in a sense or a better team that they're not supposed to beat mm-hmm. but over here like um fans uh, w- you know i don't really understand the language but you can tell what they're saying to you is very you know disrespectful i remember when i was in lebanon again in the playoffs uh, the whole army guard had to kind of barricade the whole court because of the fans and what they was doing and what they were saying. They had to postpone the game for like 20 minutes. It was just some insane type stuff. That's absolutely crazy. But Shannon, I kind of want to go back to the very beginning. You grew up in Houston, Texas, went to yeah. West Side High School. What made you fall in love with the game? Because a lot of players just like to play, you know, just to try to take pictures and don't take it that seriously. What made you fall in love with the game of basketball? Well, at a young age, my mom, she put me and my brother in, like, literally every sport at the YMCA. We played soccer. We played t-ball. We ran track, uh, flag football, basketball. And I just kind of gravitated to everything that my older brother did. And he had, like, a crazy love and, um, um, like, a insane type love for basketball at an early age. And me, I was just a young kid just um, trying to experience, have different experiences in life and etc. But to see what he was doing at that age, you know, 9, 10, 11, 12, he was outside working the game a lot. And, and I was just now playing video games and etc. But um, I really just wanted to follow in my brother's footsteps. And um, it, learned, it, it, it led to my own day. So how was from how was being from Houston pivotal for your development as a player? Because I know there are many legends that came through the city, like Joe Young, Tommy Mason Griffin, 
you know, B. King, Jonathan Simmons, you know, R.P. Melvin Swift. How was how did going against these guys nine in the nine L develop you to the player you are today? Well, I feel like it really started for me in A Leaf. Um, when I used to go to my cousin's house in the summers. Um they stayed on Spice Lane and we used to have to put like a grocery cart on the fence. And that was our way of playing basketball. And we, you know, we playing against other kids in the community and et cetera. And we'll go to the Quillian sometime and compete. And when I stayed in Park Village, um, they had this thing called the Big Boy Court across the street from my apartment. And, you know, we'll go over to me and my brother go over there and just try to get on the court and just compete against the older guys. And I just looked at these dudes like they was, you know, NBA players. So I feel like that kind of built my, um, my attitude, the way I compete on the court, because it took a lot for me at a young age just to get on the court. So when I ran into, you know, the Joe Youngs, the Jay Sims, the Mike James, the Tommies, I played Tommy in high school many times. It was just another opportunity to compete. And because I feel like at that age in high school, I wasn't as talented as I am now. You know, I, I was in a, in a sense kind of like a late bloomer. And um, I mean, I still had game. Like I still, you know, had quote unquote accolades in high school and et cetera. I had scholarships to schools and et cetera, but I wasn't nowhere near the level of a Tommy, Jonathan Simmons, uh, uh, who else was in the city at that time? Um, Jay Lucas, Gary Johnson, those type of players. I wasn't nowhere in their um, category. So I had to work extremely hard just to prove to myself and just to, you know, let myself know that I can, I can do this at a high level, but it's going to take a little bit more effort. I know when we first met, it was in the next pro league and that's pretty much where that's a program where all the top talent from Houston come into one setting and compete against each other. As is there anybody from the city that you're still itching to go against that you haven't? Uh, no, not really. You know, I feel like I can play to everybody who that usually come out in the city. But I just always enjoy competing against uh, Oliver Lafayette, uh, Daniel House, Jay Sims, uh, D'Angelo. You know, I just enjoy competing against those guys because um, I just know, well, Oliver, he was one, he was somebody that really just kind of mentored me when I was just trying to get on, on a professional level and et cetera. Him, Mike James, John Lucas. Um, they all kind of just mentored me, took me under their wing, used to buy me the workouts, used to just uh, allow me to work out with them just to um, learn the nuances of what it is to be a professional basketball player. And so anytime I get a chance to, you know, see them dudes or just catch them in the gym, it's always strap up. Like how Michael Jordan told Magic Johnson, where your shoes at, we can go at it right now. Mm -hmm. That's how it is when I see a Mike James, Oliver, you know, Jay Sims and those type of guys. That's just the type of aura and vibe you get every time you step in Houston because even in the weekends when folks are playing at Fondy, those games mm -hmm. are super competitive still. Like, it's literally yeah. a throw. Yeah, so, absolutely. <laughs> that's why I feel like people misunderstand about Houston because once you step in here, like, it's a whole different vibe, ball game. And being yeah. from Austin, Texas, we thought, you know, we were some top dogs coming out, but traveling to different cities and stuff, we just realized quickly, oh, man, like – this is extremely different. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I feel like people in Houston, where the athletes, the basketball players who, you know, still do it, they have a great deal of respect for the game mm -hmm. and just the city that they come from to, um, you know, the barbershop talk, who the best in the city, who this, who that. They got a name to uphold. So anytime they step in those gyms, the Fondy, um, when we was over in Third Ward, anytime we stepped in those gyms, it was always – okay, I still got to showcase myself even though I may be in a position now where, you know, I've seen some success as a professional basketball player. I see. And I'm glad you mentioned mentors too because that leads to my next question. Every young warrior that becomes, um, you know, an absolute, an absolute force gets it from somebody. You know, mm -hmm. every young great warrior needs their master splinter. So I'm asking you, Shannon, who is your true master splinter? Like who – gave you all the tools you need to become the great player that you are today? Well, starting in high school, my sophomore year, going to my junior year, my summer, I met Keith White. He was my AAU coach. And he he taught me um, things you can just take out outside of the basketball court as well as keep within the basketball court, like 
taught me how to be a man, taught me to look a man in his eyes, taught me to be on time, taught me to walk with a certain aura, like God put you in a position for a reason. Um, he taught me about the hard work of the game, the skill sets of the game. And he was very like, like in our practice, we never really like scrimmaged in AAU. You know, AAU, that's kind of like absurd because that's what a lot of teams just do. Get guys together, scrimmage, prepare yeah. you for, you know, a tournament. But we used to always go through specific drills that uh, were focused on specific movements, footwork, how to get open, um, rip throughs, shot fakes, you know what I mean? And he taught me the fundamentals of the game. And after college, um, I have to give credit to um, John Lucas, um, senior. Um, okay. I think his workouts are very drastically different from a Keith White workout because with John Lucas workouts, he puts you in a situation where it's like uh, either you're going to eat or you're going to be eight. You know what I mean? And like you, you, you obviously you already have to have some kind of skill set to be in those kind of workouts, but he just more so fine tuning your game. And then there's a lot of one on one stuff and just turning you into a killer and turning into somebody that whenever you step on the court, you know what it is. And I'm in my first matchup in one of his workouts was uh, with J.R. Smith. I was like 18 years oh, wow. old. This when J.R. Smith was, I want to say 25, still in, you know, still doing what he's doing in the league, you know, killed me, like destroyed me. Like to a point where I was like, okay, like I got a lot of work to do. And it was, it was, it was, it was, it was no, I'm serious. Like a lot of work to do. Like if I'm, if I'm saying I want to be a professional basketball player, if I'm saying I want to be on this type of level, mm -hmm. you, you looking at somebody that's like competing against Kobe, competing against LeBron, like, you know what I'm saying? Um, that experience really just opened my mind up to realize like, it's not going to be easy, but the work don't always show. I love that you said that, too, because, you know, a lot of young cats back home that I know, like they said that they want to be a Division One basketball player. They want to be professional. And mm -hmm. even though I'm a guy whose career ended in junior college, like I understand how tough the game could get. And I understand how complex it can get as you can get older. Mm -hmm. So my question to you is, what would you feel like is your biggest career turning point? Because, like, what made you sit there and realize, man, like, I'm willing to go hard about this. Like, I'm willing to commit my life to this. Like, what was that moment for you? Well, now nah, I used to tell my mom all the time when I was, like, eight that I wanted to be a basketball player. You know, I used to tell her that all the time. And I just didn't know. Like, you know, it was basketball camps you get invited to, basketball camps you can pay to go to that can, like, put you in situations of exposure and et cetera. But we just didn't have the, the means to do that. You know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. my 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 progression came through just being in the right situations, be putting it uh getting put in situations where I'm able to run into a Mike James, run into a Oliver Lafayette, run into a you know John Lucas the third and 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 just be able to um pick their brain and just understand what it takes to be a professional basketball player. But mm -hmm. the biggest moment for me was probably the year and a half after college. You know what I mean? Because when I graduated from college, a lot of people don't know this. It took me a year and a half before I got my first opportunity. Oh, right. Wow. And my first opportunity was in Mexico. But during that year and a half, I was training four and five times a day. You know what I mean? There's a lot of tension in my house. My mom, she had just um, um, stopped working at her um, uh, in a career field that she was in. My brother, they cut his hours at his job. So it was a lot of, you know, tension in, his, in our household. So I used to just work out a lot just to get out of the house, you know what I mean? Clear my mind and et cetera. Um, yeah. And during that time, that time of waiting, that time of trying to figure out, okay, is the opportunity going to come? Is the opportunity not going to come? It can play a mental, it can like really play with your mind. You know what I mean? And make you really right. doubt yourself, make you feel like you're not good enough, make you feel like, okay, maybe I need to go in a different direction. And so I feel like that time, that pivotal time for me was that year and a half after I graduated from college because it really showed me what I'm built like. You know what I mean? Like in one of my mantras I like to say is never fold under mental pressure. And that's a lot of mental pressure to realize, OK, I don't know where my next dollar coming from. I don't know if I'm be able to get to the gym. I used to have to sleep in my car at the workout so I wouldn't have to go all the way home, waste gas, come back. It was just a lot of stuff I was doing at that time that 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 that. Um, 
allowed me to see, okay, it's still a way you can accomplish what you want to accomplish. It may not be comfortable, but um, you know, it's still a way to uh get to the get to the goal that you have set for yourself. And so that was the pivotal <clears throat> point for me. And during that time, um Jay Sims was right there with me, you know what I mean? So we used to work on the on a uh, parking lot parking cars, fifty dollars a day. Oh wow! And, um, yeah, I mean, it was just a real life grind just to get out of that. And ten years later, you know, God put me in position. What's the importance of feeling uncomfortable for you? Because I mean, I I don't I know Hoopers could attest to this, but even people going on in their daily lives or somebody that has a passion, how important is it to stay in that uncomfortable environment? Because I understand some people are forced to, but some right. people need to be put in that position in order to push themselves over the edge. Right. So how important would you feel like that feeling is of being uncomfortable? Um, so one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible is in the uh, times of prosperity rejoice. In the times of adversity, consider God has made the one and the other so man would not know what come back. <laughs> And, sorry about that and nice. basically to me that's what that saying is never get too high never get too low mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying because when when you have highs in life okay it's cool to you know rejoice and celebrate them when you hit them low points in life don't fold though just be still and realize okay i'm in this season for even in this season for a reason God put me in this position for a reason. What is it that he's trying to show me in this season? Mm. You know what I'm saying? So when I first got my first job in Mexico, after the year and a half of grinding, everything I had went through through up until that point had built me for that situation. Mm. I didn't pray for, you know, a million dollar contract. I just prayed for opportunity, right? And right. so when I got to Mexico, um, my first team I was on, they traded me. Right. So I traded to a team right when I get to Mexico. That team traded me to quote unquote the worst team in the league. So my right. first week and a half, I'm hit with adversity. Hit with, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's gonna happen. But I met a man who said, Look, I don't have that much money, but I'm gonna I'm gonna put the ball in your hands and you I'm gonna give you the opportunity. Right. That's all you can ask for. I wasn't in the best living situation. I was sleeping in the twin bed. I slept in the twin bed at home. You know what I'm saying? Right. I had to, I had to, I had to be uncomfortable for a season. And ten years later, um, you know, I'm married. I have a whole wife. I'm very comfortable. Um, mm -hmm. But that season of my life, it built me to realize like um, hard times they shape you or they break you. Now it's your response to the hard time that's gonna make you. Is that's gonna sustain you? Right. So. And I'm glad you mentioned that verse, too, because one of my favorite verses comes from Matthew 20 through 12. And it means humble yourself. God will exalt you. But mm -hmm. if you exalt yourself, God will humble you fast. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I really felt when you said don't get too high or, you know, don't get too low and everything, because God could really put you in a place like, hey, I'm still in control. You know, you still yeah, have absolutely. my will. Absolutely. That, really, that definitely hit me. Absolutely. So um, talking about your overseas experience, going to Mexico, how was that first experience for you? Because like you said, you all you needed was an opportunity. You know, one of your one of your people linked you up with them. Like, what were the expectations going into Mexico? Man, I, I, I kid you not. So when I got the call to go to Mexico, how that all came about was I had a friend named uh, Steve Walton, and I've been knowing him since uh, middle school. You know what I mean? I've been close with his family, his brothers. We was on the same basketball team, et cetera. So he hit me on the on the back end of the year and a half of me grinding, trying to figure out what's next, getting a lot of no's. He he contacted me and said, hey, look, I'm taking a travel team to Mexico. Um, this was on a Monday. He's like, we're leaving Friday at 6 a.m. It's a good opportunity for you just to showcase yourself. And, um, 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 you know, it just put your name out there. And what I tell a lot of, you know, the homies in the city is that the opportunity that you want may not look like how you envisioned it. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I didn't think me going on a travel tour to Mexico was going to produce a whole opportunity and 
put me in position in the sexual. I just thought because I had I had done it before. Mm-hmm. So I was just like, okay. But one thing I can tell people is if an opportunity arises, no matter how it may how how it may be dressed up, how it may look, hop on that opportunity. So we went to Mexico. Um, I was contemplating it the whole week. He called me Thursday night. was like, look, bro, we leaving at 6 a.m. I'm telling you it's a good situation for you. That Friday, I leave. We go to Mexico. We drive in a van like eight hours, right? We drive to McAllen. And um, he, uh, so we played a team that just won the championship the season prior, right? Mm-hmm. And it's a really good game. It wasn't a blowout, you know what I mean? And it got too physical from what the ref said, so they had to stop the game because, you know, they guys was under contract and et cetera. So, you know, yeah, they had to protect, you know. After the game, the GM of the team came up to me, took my information, my name, my email, my number. I didn't think much of it, you know what I mean? And yeah. um, he literally called me three days later. I was like, hey, Miss Shannon, I got a, I got a, I got a team for you. Um, um, when can you leave? I'm thinking to myself, I could have left yesterday. <laughs> so it go silent, it go quiet for the, throughout the week, and he said, okay, I'm going to reach back out to you next week. I don't hear from him until that next Thursday. He telling me, oh, I was just about to call you. Your flight leave tomorrow morning at 530. It was so bad for me that my moms ain't even believe that, like, this opportunity came. Like, because, again, I had got so many no's up until that point that it was like, um, you just, you know, you know, it is one of them, another one of them situations. So I start going to my room, packing my bag. She coming up, she said, "Oh, you really leaving?" She take me to the airport. You know, she boo crying and um, going into Mexico. My whole mindset was just, I'm not gonna fold on this opportunity. Mm. I may not get another opportunity. You see what I'm saying? Like, right. I may, seriously, I may not get another opportunity after this. So. Mm. Everything I put into my game up until that point really just surfaced and, and was put out there when I got to Mexico. Mm. And um, I led the league in scoring average 28 points a game. And 10 years later. Man, after that, after that first big check from overseas, and you're finally able to help provide for your family. What type of feeling came over you when you did that? Because I know every child's dream is to put their family on. So for you, yeah, what I mean, did that I mean? So like, it's crazy because my first big check really didn't come till maybe three, four years later when I signed in Japan. But when I was in Mexico, I made five hundred dollars a month. I mm. still was sending money home to my people. Mm. I still was giving my ties to the church. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. And I feel like me being in that situation of, you know, making $500 a month, it taught me, even prior to that, it just taught me how to stretch your money and save money and be smart with um, your money and realize what's important and what's not important. You know what I mean? Because when you only got $20 to your name and it got to last you from Tuesday to Sunday, Mm-hmm. You gonna figure out a way to make that work. You see what I'm saying? So, mm-hmm. um, but when I got in position, um, it was a blessing, you know, um, because I put my mom in position. I got her a uh, food truck business, you know, and that's something she she been wanting to do. So, you know, I invested in a food truck business. Uh, my family, you know, they they know if they need anything, they can reach out, and mm-hmm. then. Obviously, I'm married. I have a house. Um, I have plans with my wife. Um, that's the ultimate blessing right there because I've been knowing my wife since we was 15. We've been friends. We was friends for a very long time. And um, so she know a lot about what I've been through. Mm-hmm. So just to be able to share in this journey with her is uh, sensational. Absolutely. So how do you navigate the market overseas? Because in basketball, you know, it's all about the situation, the system that you put in. What advice would you give to, you know, a young guy coming out of college that wants to test his overseas market? What advice would you give him in order to be successful? Uh, one thing I can give somebody coming out of college, coming overseas is don't take the opportunity for granted. You know what I mean? Like, 
don't think because you finally you you got an opportunity that is going to continue like when you get that first opportunity that's basically like your coming out party right and you got to show yourself faithful you feel what i'm saying like mm-hmm. like i said like me going to mexico had i not dominated what i did i probably would never got another opportunity after that so i tell a lot of people all the time i say look like dominate your lane and i'm not just talking about scoring the ball i'm talking about separating yourself on the court you got to look different from everybody else you competing with you see what i'm saying because because when it come that next year to, to get another opportunity they gonna look at your film mm-hmm. if you looking subpar on film they gonna say oh no nah, we don't we don't want we don't want that and the overseas is very cutthroat very cutthroat mm-hmm. so to make it to 10 years in a profession that's profession that's very cutthroat and they really don't care about you in a sense you may come across some teams some coaches that really genuinely want your well-being and etc but a lot of times like they use you as long as they 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 they, they use you as long as as long as as long as they can mm. and when they done with you they done with you so one thing i'll say is one look out for yourself and two dominate your lane don't take opportunities for granted because it's not sweet it's it's like i like i tell people it's 400 jobs in the nba right right we got all these countries overseas we can say it's probably two thousand jobs overseas it's millions of people that want one opportunity Mm. so what are you doing to separate yourself what are you doing that's gonna say okay i want to sign him you see what i'm saying and Mm -hmm. it always goes back to your routine it always goes back to you being disciplined it always goes back to um the work you're doing in the off season and not cheating the grind and being being honest with yourself Mm. When it comes to film, what would you say, you know, I'm kind, of, I'm kind of make you put a coach's hat on now, but if you're an overseas scout, what are they mostly looking for as far as like, you know, different from the NBA and other professional leagues? Because I heard a lot of things about overseas and that, about how different the structure is wherever you go. So what do they mostly look for? I mean, it's, it's just, it depends on where you're going to. Like the higher up, like Euro League, um, excuse me, Euro Cup, Champion League, these these high up leagues, uh, Spain, France, Turkey, and et cetera. Mm-hmm. They looking for a specific, um, a specific player to do a specific uh, job on the court. Mm-hmm. Like, for example, uh, a team called Red Star in um, Serbia, they're a Euro League team, right? Right. They have I want to say like three Americans and I was talking to my agent and he was telling me like, okay, this guy here, he's there only to make threes. Mm. So, so that team, they'll look at, okay, what are his percentages from three? They'll watch film, see if he can catch a shoot, shoot off the dribble, you know, and et cetera. Then they'll look at another guy and say, okay, I'm looking for you just to defend the best player on the other team and just make an open three or make an open shot. I don't need you to create for nobody. I just need you to play hard, bring energy, bring effort, and et cetera. Mm-hmm. And then they'll look at the film and say, okay, I, I need a score. Mm-hmm. Right? I need a flat out killer. You know what I'm saying? So it's just each each um country, each club, it varies by what the team needs, but it's specific to the player they want. Right. So when you say when you say cutthroat. And I'm speaking for the people that doesn't really know what goes on overseas because I'm, I mean, the real hoopers know, but there's some people out there that think, oh, if you're not in the NBA, oh, I don't think you're a basketball player. Like, there's really casual people like that out there. Mm-hmm. And I remember a quote that Lucas said one time. He said, it's harder to play in Europe than it is in the NBA. And I thought about it. And now that you're here, I'm really itching to ask you this. Like, would you say that he's right to a sense? Absolutely. You got so much space in the uh, NBA. It's hard to like just everything that come with overseas. Like they be betting on, they bet on games, they gamble on games. Um, um, it's super hard to win on the road overseas because referees get kind of dictated by the fans, and and it's just it's just very difficult. And then just in the sense of NBA, you got a lot more space. It's no defensive three. It's defense three seconds in the key. Overseas is basically like college rules as far as like helping and 
and and being in the pain and crowding the pain there's not that much space mm-hmm. um and it's more like ball movement and and you know in the nba is more like iso ball overseas is more like you actually got to have some kind of i'm not saying that nba they don't have a basketball iq or mind for the game but yeah, yeah. you got to really like be able to okay make a pocket pass mm-hmm. make the right read off the pick and roll um um um, be in the right position on defense. And then you got to deal with stuff off the court, like being paid late and sometimes not being paid at all and worrying about how your family going to get here and and just the foolishness that come with being overseas. Or like like when I, I left Turkey because my president basically went broke. Like, oh, wow. Didn't have the money. And mm-hmm. he kept lying to us. And then he finally had to just say, look, I don't have the money. Um, and... It's just stuff that you deal with like that. Or like in Ukraine, a whole war going on. And mm-hmm. like, like some Americans can't even leave. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you're not dealing with that in the NBA. So it can like be a mentally draining type thing to where it's like, man, I ain't even, like, like you questioning like, okay, did I really sign up for this? So your passion for the game got to be so deep that you like, whatever going on, I know why I'm here. I know what I love to do. I know how long I've been doing this. Mm -hmm. And I meant to ask you about this, what's going on in Ukraine too, because there are a lot of professional players that, like you said, can't leave the area. And I know Mm -hmm. Shabazz Napier just got sent home from Ukraine. So uh, do you have any friends out there in the area right now dealing with what's going on? Yeah, actually, you know, D'Angelo was in Ukraine. And I Mm -hmm. talked to him and uh, he not, obviously he not there no more, you know, in a whole nother situation. And then a homie named Teray Murray, he was in Ukraine. He just got home probably a week ago. He was stuck at the border for like 15 hours, he told me, and it was just some unfortunate, you know, stuff going on. It's just a crazy world that we live in where um, things that are outside of your control mm. really have an effect on your livelihood. Right. And, um, it's very unfortunate. It's insane, and especially considering how – you know, the past few years, how the overseas scene looked due to COVID. Mm-hmm. And I want to ask you as well, throughout your years, how much different was it financially and structurally when COVID hit? Because obviously here in America, we had our own rules and regulations, but how was mm-hmm. it there overseas? Um, it, w- it was different. Well, last year I was in Japan. Mm-hmm. So like outside of the NBA, Asia is probably the highest paying market you can ever go to, you know what I'm saying? And so I was in a comfortable situation, thank God, you know, but it was still different because it was a lot of postponed games. It was a lot of like empty gyms because fans sometimes weren't, weren't allowed. Um, um, so I didn't really feel like the impact financially. I just felt it from a sense of like um, empty gyms. Like mm-hmm. I'm not used to this, you know what I'm saying? I see. And on the point of empty gyms, too, there was a lot of talk people have been saying about the NBA bubble, about how, you know, the games there didn't count. It was amplified because there's no fans there. It was like a wide game. Like, what's your exact opinion on that? Because I'm on the fence of how to feel about, you know, the bubble, you know. So mm-hmm. what's your opinion about that? My opinion is that, like, that just showed you um, the passion dudes have for the game. You know what I mean? If you can be in a, a bubble for two and a half, three months, away from your family, away from your friends, um, not living an ideal life, um, that's that shows me that 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 the passion outweighs the circumstance. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And obviously, you know, a lot of NBA players said to describe the mental toy you had on them and et cetera, you know, which is granted, you know what I mean? You're in a very uncomfortable situation. Um, at the same time, though, I, like I said, um, that's when you got to have them self-talks with yourself. You know what I mean? Them hard conversations with yourself just to get you through and um, stand on your solid foundation that you built over the years. And um, so that's my viewpoint on it. I think it just showed like the passion that, guys have for the game to really sacrifice time with their family, friends, during a time where, you know, it was dangerous to be in 
it still is, but to be in close proximity with other people. Mm -hmm. and so for them to do that, it just showed me that, okay, this is what I love to do. And granted, like you get paid millions of dollars to do this. So that probably went into it as well. But yeah, um, I feel like your peace of mind is more important than anything. So would you say it was harder to win an NBA championship in a bubble because of fans or you feel like that's overblown basketball is basketball? I'm the type that think basketball is basketball. Like fans, no fans. I don't think you get motivated by fans. Mm. See what I'm saying? Like I don't think, I don't think like like like, okay, having fan, having fans in the crowd is a plus because it can you know rejuvenate those spirits and, and help you help you uh, stay locked into a game. But with no fans, it's more so internal type motivation you got to have. Mm. And if you're not built like that, it's gonna show. I see, I see. That's the same thing I said too. But for some reason, everybody want to say like, "Oh, the bubble's like a wire game." I'm like, "Nah, basketball still played at a high level. Like, you can't, yeah. you can't just think that and think like, oh, it's easier. It'll never be no. easier. No, it's not. It definitely played at a high level for sure. So, Very high level. So." Basketball as a whole, like it obviously evolved throughout the years, especially from the early beginnings and with basketball evolved and social media evolves, too. And I was looking at J.J. Reddick's podcast one day and he said it's funny how, you know, athletes at 16, 17 years old, they have to make one of the biggest decisions of their life at yeah. such a young age. Yeah. And especially with the impact of social media. And, you know, people want to record everything that adds on an extra pressure. So what difference would you feel, you know, back then when you were growing up to how it is now for young guys? I think I was in the very early stages of like social media mm -hmm. like growing up. But now it's like exponentially different, like because, like you said, everything's recorded. Kids can get an NIL deal. Kids can get paid now in high school. Um you know, you can get endorsements. Um, you don't even have to go to college now. You can go to the overtime league. You can go to Australia. You know what I'm saying? There's so many different avenues to accomplish your dreams. And that's really just the biggest difference. Um, back then, we didn't have as many avenues. You know, it was either go to college. Nobody was going overseas. I think the first person I heard that went overseas was Brandon Jennings. Yeah. But other than that, um, it was either go to college or, you know, find a different route. But now you can go to college, you can go overseas, you can go, you can stay in the States, you can go to the G League. You know what I'm saying? There's so many different avenues that these kids have to, to, to accomplish their dreams. And, you know, I'm for it. You know what I mean? Because if you know what you want to do at a young age and you already have a, you know, a, a, a vision of how you want to accomplish that and you get, you get put in a position to be able to accomplish that, mm -hmm. I don't think you can tell a kid no to that. So with being, um, because like you said, Brandon James was the first one to go from high school to overseas. And then you had guys like Emmanuel Moody doing it after him. Mm -hmm. Would you say that they have to watch for a certain type of treatment overseas if they go there? Because if they can, oh, you're just a kid, I could treat you any type of way or it's all strictly professional throughout. No, I feel like what Brandon went, he went to Spain, I believe. I feel like that that league is very professional, and I'm sure he didn't go like by himself, right? You know, what I'm and I'm sure he had, you know, a guardian with him, somebody with him, just to make sure he stayed um, on the straight and narrow. Like when Lamelo went to Australia, he had somebody that was very close to the family with him the whole time. So it's not. I don't think they could get uh, bamboozled out there. But China different too, though. Like China, just a whole different ball game. Like they move to their own horn, they do what they want to do. So you just got to be on guard at all times um, at a young age if you're trying to get involved in this professional setting because people gonna gonna try to get over on you for sure. Mm. So overall, throughout your throughout your decade overseas, what would you say is the best place, you know, scenically you've been to? Because traveling to all different places in Europe, I know you're bound to see a lot of beautiful landscapes. Yeah, uh, I'd probably say Australia, mm. for sure. Australia, Australia, I enjoy South Korea and uh, Japan as well, but probably Australia for sure. Because mm. it's so like 
like Americanized. They speak fluent English. It's not like a language barrier. The the country is beautiful. You have beaches in every city. The basketball is a one. You're competing against you know some really good players. It's a it's a really good league, mm -hmm. um, and um, it's run very professionally. Like you're gonna be paid on time. You don't gotta worry about your payments. Your living arrangements is gonna be real good. Your car is gonna be good. Your mm -hmm. family gonna be up. You know what I mean? Everything is run a one. So I I definitely say Australia. And also. With you being overseas so long, I know you've seen thousands of basketball players that really caught your eye. Some that are really good, or some that are probably bad. But so, but as far as the best ones, who is the best competition you faced against overseas, like throughout your whole entire time? Like what country? I like just player. Uh, player, player. Um, that's a good question. I'm very, I'm a very hard critic. Um. <laughs> I'll say two Holloway. He can really play. I heard of him. Um, um, Bryce Cotton. Bryce Cotton can really play. Mm. Um, Murphy Holloway. Um, DJ Nubel. Um, I know it's quite a lot. I, I know it's quite a lot. It might take a D'Angelo. I played D'Angelo in Turkey. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just, just to name a few. That's off the top. I'm I'm pretty sure it's a lot more, but that's just off the top. Paul Marin Marindini, mm -hmm. play. That's my guy. Um, Manny Harris. I played him in China. Mm. He can play. Walter Hodge. He can play. Yeah. So I didn't I didn't play against some 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 you know some dudes that i feel like they got game for sure and i feel like they'll say the same about me so of course of course like the talent is super deep over there i feel like people don't really realize like just because you travel overseas and don't play in the nba like you're still playing against high level competition even at times better than the league yeah it's, some killers, like, it's definitely some killers like i feel like to just to get to the pro level overseas is not like again it's not easy because mm -hmm. you you're going up against millions of people, just like making an NBA, you know, you're going against against millions of people jockeying for like one job. So mm -hmm. it's definitely not easy. It's insane. And I'm thinking back to the first part of the interview when you kept saying you were a late bloomer, like your game didn't come along until, you know, later in your career. How would you mm -hmm. say your game evolved over the years compared to when you were younger? Man, it's it's crazy. Like if you'd have seen me in high school, you would have probably thought I was like a a three four. You know what I mean? But I used to play a lot of positions in high school. I used to bring the ball up court one. You know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. Just just the nuances of the game, the handle, the shots, the 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 uh, mental focus I need, the defense, being able to guard multiple positions and um, competing in and. and um just realizing that when you become a pro it's not about like an open shot for a pro is different for an open shot for a college kid right you know what i'm saying and mm -hmm. like so like a shot you didn't see me play a shot that i shoot may not look open to a lot of people but i'm like this is an open shot for me <laughs> you know what i mean and so just realizing like where my spots are on the court being comfortable in that and um letting it translate and I mean, I gotta give credit to my trainers too, Mike Bud, Jay Crab, uh, Gene. When I was working with Gene, my 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 physio, my sports trainer, uh, Cap. You know, uh, we lock in every summer. You know, and we get to it. So I hold them accountable. They hold me to a high standard. I hold hold them to a high standard. And I obviously, you know, look at games from prior seasons, see why I can be better. Mm -hmm. And um. You know, Boog and uh, Jay Crab do the same. And when we get in the gym, they hit me with new uh, scenarios I may be put in, new situations that can help fine tune my game. And mm. I really lock in with it and just try to, you know, go from there. I remember I was on campus the other day and I was talking to one of the assistant coaches because I got a Texas Southern, by the way. Mm -hmm. And we have an assistant coach named Josh White, and he went to UNT. Mm -hmm. I think he was there the same time you was there too. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And honestly, I'm kind of going off the rails when I'm overseas to college, but how was your experience at North Texas? Um, it was it was fun. That was when I won my first championship in college, well, second actually. Mm-hmm. Um, but my first year at North Texas, we won the championship. Second year, we lost in the final at the buzzer. You know, playing with Josh was a lot of fun. You know, and all my other teammates, Trish and Thompson, George, uh, LB, Ked. You know, I, I the list goes on. Um, so just being able to compete with them guys, we got memories that's gonna last forever. Obviously, when you win a championship, is is different. You know what I mean? Because you connected to a group for forever. You know, because now you got a banner, it hang up, and etc. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, my, my time at UNC was very fun, but it was also very challenging because my coach, um, like I tell I, I tell a lot of people all the time, like, trust your work. You know what I'm saying? Trust your work. Like, um, it's, it's, it's very tough when you, you want to play instinctively, mm-hmm. but you feel like the coach is holding you back. Or if you do something, you got to look over your shoulder and you're nervous. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Because of what the coach has said to you. And right. um, that that could kill confidence quickly. My confidence was hit. My coach used to tell me not to shoot. He used to just tell me, I just need you to play defense. Mm-hmm. Rebound. Don't shoot. You know what I mean? And you telling somebody that I'm 19, 20 years old, and you telling me that, and um, why did you even bring me here then? Exactly. You know what I'm like what 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 if you don't even want me to shoot, like not even try to look at the rim, anything, make me this one dimensional player, mm-hmm. why bring me here. Like it's but clearly killing really your game. For sure it was. For sure it was. And that that was just a testimony again to just the fact that like I tell all the young guys in the city, just trust your work, bro. Trust mm-hmm. it. You putting in the work, the work gonna show. Exactly. Like when you second guess, that's the worst player you can be as a player that's that's hesitant and second guessing it and mm-hmm. thinking too much. Just play. You know what I'm saying? And um, but I thank God for that moment because it again it showed me uh what I was built like because I got through that time, those two years, we I still was very successful. Mm-hmm. But again, it did show me that how a coach can like really, you know, um have a player shackle in a sense exactly and that brings me back to um there's one other podcast episode i saw with gilbert arenas and what he was discussing was how much high school players are or college players are ruined by these shackles like in high school you were pit bull like you were all mm-hmm. certain candidate you had you know multiple awards and then you go to college then you literally in this box like you can only do this one part of your game instead of the other where you thrive in yeah. so i feel like it's really important for kids to go to a program to where they're able to you know expand their game like they're mm-hmm. able to do what they're doing before but then add another element perfect is, perfect example is steph curry dame lilla ja moran cj mccullough you know what i mean they could have easily went to well they couldn't because they didn't have big that big name schools recruiting them but Mm-hmm. I tell guys like like you just said. I tell like I had a conversation with uh, a young girl this summer, uh, 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 NY daughter, and she uh, was asking me like, when you making the college decision, what what is like going through your mind? I say go where you feel most comfortable. Well, you don't feel like you're gonna be restrained. Where you trust the coaches, where you believe in them, where they gonna let you play your game confidently and that's the only decision I can make. It can be high level, low level, but go where you feel most comfortable and mm-hmm. showcase yourself. And from that, you know, what's supposed to happen will happen. Right. That's absolutely true. And kind of going to the NBA because you mentioned those guys. Um, when you were watching the game growing up, who were the players that influenced you or guys that you wanted to play like? Like who had a direct impact of the development of your game? Off top, Michael Jordan. Mm-hmm. Um Kobe, T Mac, AI. Uh, I used to love KG. Um, that yeah, that little group right there. And then in this new era, uh, KD, Steph. Um, I'm, I'm loving John Morant, Dame Lillard. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, I love to watch Draymond. Um, Brian, obviously, you know, I feel yeah. like he's on everybody's list. But, uh, yeah, but if I had to pick just one, I'd say Michael Jordan. I, I still watch film of him every day. Mm-hmm. Listen. I could kind of see it in your game too, because you thrive off the simple things in the court. Like your game is not super flashy, but it's hella effective. Mm-hmm. Like I remember I was watching the highlight film of you in Turkey. You, I think your teammate was going to transition then you were staying on the edge then you just caught the ball jab and just simple pull up. Like mm-hmm. just little things like that, that I don't see a lot of players right now taking advantage of because basketball is a game of angles. Yeah. And watching your game, you have that mastery. I tell people all the time that it's easy to score. Like, I feel like people put too much thought and too much, try to put too much into it. Like, my whole thing is just let me get to my spot. Get to my spot. If I get my shot off, I get it off. I can't, I'm going to find the right read. You know what I mean? Like, you don't need 15, 20 dribbles. You know what I mean? Two, three dribbles enough. And, um, again, I work on my game, though. And, you know, like I said, I was a late bloomer. Uh, God did bless me with a talent for sure, but I had to work at it as well. And, um, you know, uh, I'm in a good position 10 years later. You know, a lot of people in the city try to reach out to me and work out with me and et cetera. And, you know, I just try to be a, 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 a sponge to them and just let them soak up what they need to soak up. And because mm-hmm. um, I know, like, even though it's not like some I, aspire for i know like a lot of the guys in the city look to me you know what i mean for like motivation for inspiration and mm-hmm. i take it with a grain of salt and you know try to be, be be what i can be facts and if you were in the city right now or specifically apart you have to call a five of your homies to play a game for what 20k 30k who would you call oh that's easy d'angelo jay sims jay coombs and um I'd probably say that's a hard one. I could tell that fourth spot. <laughs> I'd say PJ, maybe PJ when he on his game though. He be BS. <laughs> PJ, I call uh, uh, Justin Reynolds. I call JR, mm-hmm. B King. You know what I mean? I just know me, D'Angelo, and Sims ain't gonna lose. Oh no. Mm-mm. You know what I'm I saying? Like me and D'Angelo <laughs> won't lose. Me and Sims won't lose. Like as long as I got one of them, I'm I'm solid. Because <laughs> I know I know what I'm gonna get. You know what I'm saying? So absolutely. Yeah. And I know Coombs, I know he's gonna give me at least uh fishing 15 and 10 easily so i mean if it's the bread on the line too like when the bread on the line you can't have people too emotional like you just got to be locked in focused you know because it's a lot first of all the crowd gonna be crazy you know you got all the hood dudes in there and etc and mm-hmm. then so it's gonna be a lot of talk on the sideline and etc so you can't you just gotta stay locked in and i can't have people that's involved in the crowd now focus on this 30 bands we're about to win bro. <laughs> you know what i'm saying so nah for real are you speaking the truth when you say if you have if you have if you have D'Angelo or Sims, like I literally watched you and Sims average 40 points through a whole championship game. So I definitely <laughs> I definitely know you're right about that. Yeah. So uh the last few questions, because I know we're getting a little over 40 minutes. No, nah, we good, what, bro. We you. What advice would you tell your 13 year old self? Because I feel like this is an important question for a lot of us as individuals, because as we get older, we get to a certain place where either we feel stuck or we feel like we're not where we should be. But in reality, we're living out our 13 year old's dreams. So Mm -hmm. if you have to say right now, what advice would you give him for the future? Uh, Never move off emotion. That's the first thing. Um, Two, um, trust your gut, trust your instinct. You know what I mean? I feel like as we go through life, we second guess a lot of stuff. And you feel it like, like you can feel it, but it's like, ah, nah, that ain't it. Uh, and uh, don't worry about what other people think. You know what I'm saying? Like, be your own man. 
and make sure you get you a solid foundation you can stand on. Mm-hmm. I mean, I got a lot of principles I stand on, and and then another is just move with integrity. You know what I'm saying? Like, don't do anything against your moral fortitude. Right. You know what I'm saying? Because like the Bible says, you upheld by your integrity. Who are you? You know what I'm saying? Don't try to fit in. Don't do stuff because other people doing it and etc. But move to the beat of your own horn. Mm. You know, and um, lastly, I would just say um, it's cool to like be still sometime, slow down. Mm. Everybody try to rush and try to get to the next, you know what I'm saying? Now, just sit still, gather your thoughts, sit in your mind a little bit Mm. because in that moment of, of stillness. Stuff will be revealed to you. Yeah. And lastly, just always remember that you can't control what you know what may happen to you, what people do to you, what people say to you. You can't control your response. Mm. And your response, like I told you, is what sustains you. So um make sure when you faced with um some difficulties in life or whatever you may face. Just make sure the response is coming from a place of mental fortitude. Yeah. I love it. I actually love it, especially the be still one. It's like you spoke to me a little bit, you know, <laughs> like that was that was a heck of a word. I loved it. And lastly, too, I want to talk about your foundation. It's only right. It's a great initiative where you go and help out. You know, you, do, you donate supplies to high schoolers, middle schoolers elementary schoolers what was your motivation into finding that foundation uh just knowing how i was brought up knowing like my mama was a hustler my mama got it done by herself she raised me my siblings and she always found a way no excuses and i got a great deal obviously i got a great deal of respect for my moms and etc but you know sometimes she made uh being uh she made being uncomfortable look comfortable you know what i'm saying and uh so just you know the way you know me and my mom my mama raised me you know and i just got a heart for people you know what i'm saying because i know what you're going through you know what i'm saying i i i, I didn't survive off a peanut butter and jelly sandwich i didn't survive off some uh wieners and rice i didn't you know what i'm saying i didn't been in some real life situations mm-hmm. to where it's like I'm not asking for a handout, but somebody, you know, can at least uh, be of service, as the Bible tells us to do. So my foundation, that's exactly what we're doing. We're just serving the community, you know what I mean, uplifting the the, the average youth um, through scholarships, through my free basketball camp, through my uh, uh, back-to-school drive, through my turkey giveaway. We're just trying to be of service to the community and uplift the community and just be a light and a vessel, you know, and... Uh, I'm still trying to grow the foundation. This is my fourth year with it, and um, I'm excited about it, you know, and I got some great ideas on the horizon that I'll probably uh, announce soon, but um, mm-hmm. really just the core initiative of the foundation is just to serve the community, be a light to the youth, give them something to look to, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? Because they've been in a lot of different situations, a lot of different circumstances where they don't know that what's next you know mm-hmm. so if you have a kid in the hood just come to a free basketball camp get them out of that circumstance get them around some people that's going to enlighten them that's going to uplift them that's going to speak life into them and just going to teach them foundational principles mm-hmm. of life and you know you can enjoy doing what you love to do i feel like that's a blessing to that kid he's going to remember that for the rest of his life same thing with the scholarship you invest in somebody sometimes people just need an opportunity i'm mm-hmm. one of them people so if you invest in an individual and tell them, look, I believe in what you're trying to accomplish. I'm going to show you by my action. Here's a $500 check. Here's a $1,000 check. Put this towards your books. Put this towards your school. Put this towards whatever you're trying to accomplish through um, your educational means. They're going to remember that for a long time. So when they hit that adversity at school, they don't feel like studying. They got a hard test coming up. They're going to remember, okay, this individual believed in me. Mm-hmm. And that's what it's all about. Man. 
That's amazing stuff right there, man. And Shannon, I really, really appreciate you stopping by the podcast because you dropped a lot of gems for the people. And I know for sure you just motivated the hell out of me. <laughs> like, I can tell you honest truth. Like, you motivated the hell out of me. And I'm pretty sure you will motivate a lot of people that listen to this episode. So, Shannon, mm -hmm. man, I really appreciate your time. Nah, I appreciate you. Thank you for having me. You know, I'm going to see you when I get back to the city. You know, it's always love, brother. Oh, yeah, most definitely, bro. We got to link up. Yes, sir. So, ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate you stopping by for another episode of In My Humble Opinion. Like I said, season two, heavy hitters. Watch out for more to come. So I appreciate mm -hmm. you guys for showing up. Amen.